So let's talk about these Eastern philosophies, which today, Western philosophies, like the legacy of Kant, that's what someone will talk about later. What's happened is since about the 1700s, 1800s, West, only since then, Westerners have looked at this, <laughs> what I've got on the map there, and gone, whatever they're doing, it's not what we're doing, because we're better than them. That's been the attitude. That's been said sort of officially and implicitly. Both those things have been going on. And there's, that's started to change in the last couple of years. What is philosophy? These people, are, these people are thinking. These people are con contributing. But often, it's because they're contributing in ways where we don't know as much. And so it's a little, it's a little bit, bit more difficult to get our footing. I would imagine most of you at some point, I'm not saying you remember all of it or any of it, have had things in probably American history or European history. How many of you have studied the history of the Indian subcontinent? We offer it here, but you probably know nothing about it. How many of you know, know the, the history of China, Japan? And it's, it's not that it's not out there. The, the information's out there these days, but we probably haven't been exposed to it. That's why this stuff, I think, people find it divided because well, I, I, I don't have the frame of reference. So what I'm going to do here is this is going to be like the, the appetizer platter of some Eastern philosophy stuff. I'm not going to go too in-depth, but just a little bit of a tour. And I'll we'll put some resources up on Blackboard as well. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to move farther and farther east. So I'm going to start in India. The goal is I'm going to start in India, go to China, just have a little, little bit of time in Japan, and then we're going to go back to the Middle East. So, Indian philosophy. There are at least, off the top of my head, about 16 schools of Indian philosophy that I can think of. Okay. Now, it would be, since here we're going on a little bit of an excursion, there's no way I can go into any of them in depth. Really, so I'm just going to do a couple that are the most well known. But there's way, 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 way more. But here's just a sampling. And the first one we have is uh, who we see depicted there. We're going to take a look at um, Advaita Vedanta, or just really Vedanta for short. So Vedanta is a philosophy that comes out of India that develops as a response to the earliest texts, religious texts. And these earliest religious texts are hymns. Hymns to what? Really, the universe. And various gods. So there's Shiva, there's Vishnu, there's Indra, Brahma, all these various gods, there's, there are hymns to them, and they really are written in such a way that they're meant to be sung. Especially the earliest ones, the Veda. So there's these old hymns, and they're called the Vedas. And then later, these books develop that are almost commentaries or stories derived from the Vedas called the Upanishads. The Vedas are almost like, it's almost like the Psalms, like there's, there's songs that are meant to be sung about these holy things. Oh, Brahma, like right, this God, this or that. These Upanishads come later. These are texts which some of, some of them are commentaries on it. Oh, when the Veda says this, it's actually talking about this thing. And then there are other texts that come later, like the big one. The Mahabharata is the longest poem in the world. That's not. It dwarfs the Iliad, or the Odyssey, or the Odyssey, or the Aeneid. It's huge. And you probably know part of it. There's an episode in there called the Bhagavad Gita. Has anyone at least heard that before, the Bhagavad Gita? Some of you have. The Bhagavad Gita is this little episode that happens in there. And that's well known. Okay. But these are this is a big story. So this is these stuff are like hymns. These are commentaries and little almost like little parables of sorts. There's one where I can't remember which Upanishad it is off the top of my head, where someone goes and meets death itself and has a conversation with death. It's a great one. And then the Mahabharata has one big giant epic. This is the epic of epic, epics. It, it, it's fantastic. I, I, I haven't finished it <laughs> because it's huge. It's like yeah, I have a version of it somewhere. It's like ten volume, like ten giant like, door stopper books in, in English. But Vedanta is this philosophical system that is trying to interpret the Vedas, the text. And so, so listen. Like here's a little. Here's a sample from the Rig Veda. And this is something that was sung. And sometimes it echoes things in other 
religious traditions, but this is the early, 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 early Vedanta. And it sounds like, to me, this sounds, it reminds me of Parmenides in some ways. Then even, and remember, this was a song, but then even nothingness was not, nor existence. There was no air then, nor the heavens beyond. What covered it? Where was it? And who's keeping? Was there then cosmic water that in depths unfathomed? There was neither death nor immortality, nor was there then the torch of night and day. The one breathed windlessly and self-sustaining. There was that one then, and there was no other. At first there was only darkness wrapped in darkness. All this was only unillumined cosmic water. That one which came to be enclosed in nothing arose at last, born of the power of heat. In the beginning, desire descended on it. That was the primal seed, born of the mind. Further down. But after all, who knows? Who can say whence it all came and how creation happened? The gods themselves are later than creation, so who knows truly whence it has arisen? Whence all creation had its origin, the creator, whether he fashioned it or whether he did not, the creator who surveys it all from the highest heaven, he knows. Or maybe even he does not know. Now, there are aspects in here that frankly remind me of the Jewish tradition. Genesis 1. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Where was it? And the spirit of the Lord hovered on the waters. There's Hashem floating on like an empty void. Part of it sounds like that. Part of it sounds like Parmenides. What was the creating agent here? The one. There's one thing. And maybe it wasn't. And it also part of it sounds like the demiurge of Plato. Like it didn't understand what it was doing. And then the world came into being. So that's what a lot of ancient philosophy is about. Like, how does, how does this world get here? We still do that, by the way. If you study the Big Bang in physics or other things, how did the universe get here? It's the same question. How did we get here? It's almost like we've been thrown, like we were launched. That's this question here in these texts. Now, these texts, now later, if you fast forward to now, this stuff is called typically Hinduism. Because if you've ever heard of Hinduism, this is it now. But in the ancient world, Hinduism, there is not one big Hinduism. It's a, it's almost like a constellation of things that we call Hinduism, which is basically still a catch-all term for whatever the people beyond the Indus River, the Indus River, the Hindus are doing. That's what that term even means. Whatever they're doing, that's, that's Indian Hinduism stuff. And this, But this is probably the most main, if there were one like large current that we're directing at all, this is probably the main current, Vedanta. And hey, Veda Vedanta at that. What is Vedanta? Especially stuff, we follow the Vedas. Like stuff like this. We're asking these kinds of questions. Like this guy, Shankaracharya, the founder of, yeah, maybe founder might be too strong a word, but a consolidator of what becomes Vedanta philosophy in India. Usually, looking at the Vedas, having all these texts, all this cool stuff, he says this all means of knowledge, and this is, I'll, I'll try and post some of this stuff up in Blackboard too. All means of knowledge, that is the way we know things exists only as dependent on self-experience. And since such experience is its own proof, there is no necessity for proving the existence of the self. Now this is anticipating a lot. So here's what he's saying here. Okay, that seems like, um, okay, sure, I don't know what that means. What are some things that you can doubt? Right, we've done this before, and this is what people often think philosophy is, right? How do you know you're not dreaming right now? Wake up, wake up! How do you know you're not dreaming right now? Do you? Really? Yeah, well, okay, so people have said stuff like this, but how do we know we're not? All right, the, the one that's really popular today, and it's actually, this goes back to uh, Baudrillard. How do we know we're not in a simulation right now? Like, we're in a computer program. That's running, we just happen to be like, it's great because we're conscious, but someone could deactivate it anytime. How do we know we're not in a simulation? Like really good VR, AR, something like that. How do we know? Do we? Can we possibly know that? We, we could doubt that, so we could doubt that this stuff is real. Plato does that. But I'm not saying that this is a simulation, I'm saying like the physical, this is not the realest thing that there is. There's a, there's a higher reality. And morally, certain religions will say that too. Christians, Jews, Muslims, like this world is temporal. There will be a new creation where things are more real, more fixed, and more permanent. 
Right? This one's not. This is not all there is. And we see, but and we see, but in a mirror, darkly. Quote Paul. What the one thing you can't doubt? That there's a you doing the doubting. So if I'm going, I don't know, whatever, I don't know if I believe. Well, then if there's if there's <laughs> nothing that you can doubt, there has to be a you doing the doubting. Now there's a French thinker in the 1600s that would come along named René Descartes say the exact same thing. Also, Augustine said this too to some degree. Christian thinker. But here, like, there's one. If there's one thing you can't doubt is that you're doing a doubt. So what that means for him, Shankaracharya, is that if there's one thing that doesn't need to be proven, it's that the self exists. There is a me. There's a you. There's a me. There's a you. But what is me? What am I? Glad you asked. You are Atman. You are Atman. You are, and that is it's kind of like a really the Sanskrit word for like soul, person, individual. You're that. What's the universe though? The universe is Brahman. You're Atman, the universe is Brahman. And here's the thing. They're actually the exact same thing. They're the exact same substance. How can that be? In other words, you, this kind of, this, to, to some degree, this reminds me of Plotinus and Neoplatonism that I talked about last time. This is you, this is the universe. Advaita, the Advaita here means, that means like non-dualism. Like not, I mean, not two. These are the same thing. You are the universe, and the universe is you. This is not to say that you, like I am the universe, do what I say. No, that's that's not what's being said. I've heard that someone make that interpretation. It's absolutely ridiculous. But that there's this thing, there's this distortion that happens now for for Indian philosophy. It's not because of the physical body, but it's because of our individuated consciousness. We kind of our senses are a bit off. Like we're misinterpreting reality. Things are not as they appear. What we see around is our appearances, but not things as they are. Because things as they are are singular. The universe is Brahman. We are Atman. And really, there's this process called moksha, which is the realization that all of reality is fundamentally one. Or fundamentally singular. It's all one thing. There's only one world here. There's one universe. And we're all equal parts of it. So you are just as much a part of the universe as anyone else, or as anything. You are no more important than anything else. But you're, it's not that, that's not to denigrate you. It's not that you're not as important as anything else. You're just as important as everything else. Even you are just as important as the, the smallest creature or the largest mountain. We're all on equal footing. We're all part of the same totality. And this is why often in, in many Indian schools there's this notion of ahimsa. If you've heard of Ahimsa, you've probably heard it with, re with relevance to Mahatma or Mahandas Gandhi. Nonviolence. Well, listen, if we're all one and the same, if we commit violence towards something else, who are we hurting indirectly? Ourselves. If we annihilate another, we end up hurting ourselves. Not just in some you know, metaphorical sense, but really. And this isn't just for other people, but also especially for other, say, like animals. This is why there's a lot of vegetarianism in a lot of these Indian schools, especially this one, we don't consume animal flesh. Why? Because they're us. It's not a notion of rights. Like, okay, well, they have rights. Like, It's not that. Okay, the results might be the same. But the attitude is here, we're part of the same, we're part of the same universe. Now you could argue, well, well, what about plants then? Aren't they part of the same universe? Yeah, but they're not conscious. Some of us have the privilege of consciousness and we're more aware. We can recognize that consciousness in others too. That elevated aspect of being. So when we see that, we should... Ahimsa, engage in nonviolence. Whereas those things which are conscious, and conscious things have more a greater awareness of the Brahman Atman connection. There are many other Indian schools of thought. I'm gonna go over one more Indian one. But that Advaita Vedanta, that's the big one. That's the one which today you could really modern Hinduism evolved from that. But there's others. There's Charvaka, 
which is very much like skepticism. Like, they don't believe any, anything I just said. They're like, nope. Vedas, they're trash. Don't believe it. Don't believe anything. They're almost more skeptical than the skeptics are. Okay, the Nyayas, and the Nyaya Sutras, they basically embedded Indian logic and mathematics. Vasheshika, there's all these other schools of Indian thought, so I almost feel like I'm doing a disservice skipping it, but, but I have to move on for the sake of time. So let's take a look at another school of thought that has its origins in India, and is also a rejection pretty much of everything I just said. But this is a rejection that gets like Charlaka philosophy in India is not as well known. You've probably heard, at least have heard of Buddha before. Or you've been in some hipster store that sells little Buddhas. Okay, and incense, of course. They can't have one without the other. I'm not picking anybody up in there. Now one thing I neglected to say about Vedanta is one of the conclusions is this. In Vedanta, this is what we realize this Brahman Atman relationship produces is this notion of Dharma. What is Dharma? That's what you're supposed to do. Since you're Brahman and Atman, you're the particular manifestation of Atman. Dharma is what you're supposed to do. So you've been you're Brahman manifested in a particular place in time and space and history. Doing, dharma is doing what you're supposed to do in Vedanta. So now this leads to the caste system, but it's not reducible to the caste system. So in other words, in, in short, like you were born into a family of bakers. You're going to be a baker when you grow up. What should you do? Be the best baker you can be. Or what? If you go out of alignment with your dharma, all right, a misalignment, if you don't do your duty that you're supposed to do, this accrues karma. Now, this is a word that we use often. In English, even. I'm sure everybody's heard of karma before. And I guarantee you, you're not using it the right way. So, like, what is the, the notion of karma? Well, this is where Western, Western thought is pretty funny. Most of the time, people think of karma as you do something that's going to come back bad, that's going to come back to bite you. That's not karma. That's actually the Christian concept of sowing and reaping. Do something, it will come back. In. Karma is this. You do your dharma, you do your duty. When you die, since you're since we're all Brahman, you're going to be reincarnated again. You will end up going into a higher form of consciousness. So this elevation of consciousness to the point where we eventually achieve high forms of consciousness and awareness. More re realizing, getting a better unity with Brahman. Don't do your dharma, you get bad karma. What does that mean? You do you don't do your dharma, you get bad karma. That means when you reincarnate again, you come back with something with lower consciousness. You might come back as a crab and be not and then and that what, 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 why is that bad? To be come back in a lower form like as a cockroach or something. It's not that oh no, I'm a cockroach. You're, you won't be self-aware about it. It's that now you're in a state of being where you don't realize that you're an atman at all. That's what you've done. So that's what karma is. It affects you when your body is reincarnated. It's not you do something bad, or you were mean to somebody in the drive-thru and now you have a flat tire. That's not karma. That's something else. Now, why do I say that? Now again, the Bhagavad Gita, Arjuna is this prince. He's like, I don't want to be a warrior anymore. I quit. He's in the middle of a giant war in this giant epic. And God... One of the manifestations of God shows up and is like, <laughs> excuse me, get back to work. Do your dharma, or else you're going to ruin the entire, like you're going to shatter, not, it's not, it doesn't just affect you, it affects your whole country, it affects your whole society, it affects the world. world. Do your dharma. Okay, I'll go back to work, and he goes back. I got grossly oversimplified with the God we needed, but there it is. It's, 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 it's great to read. Well, why do I say all this? Oh, you in the back. And one question that you get from there. This question. Can karma be looked at like a bank account? You got to you get add to it, you subtract from it. Yeah, that's right. At the end, if you got a positive account, you go up. You got a negative account, you go down. Pretty much. But the the credit that you've accrued is only in accordance with you acting in accordance with your dharma. Yeah. All right. It's not like oh, I did a good deed. Good deed points. It's like you can do the nicest thing. thing you can do the nicest thing ever. Was it your dharma to do it? Because like, all right, like listen, guys. I know. <laughs> say you're again. Say you're a part of a warrior class. Uh, you're a knight of some kind. 
I go to work, I was like, sometimes I'm tired of the last night baking cookies for the bake sale. Uh uh, we need you awake today. So if it effect, now it's affected your ability to perform your task that you have, that might have been the nicest thing ever. That's, that's, that's bad karma. But I did a good thing. So it's not just good things. Good is only good in accordance with a particular dharma. So whatever your job is, do it well. Aristotle would agree with that in his ethics. If you have a particular task, do that task well. So we're going to talk now about Siddhartha Gautama, who is an Indian prince. North India, like today this would be in the country of Nepal. Who's going to say, yeah, don't do that. There he is. Siddhartha Gautama, also known as the Buddha. And there's a lot of stories about the Buddha that may be apocryphal. I'm not going to go into too much detail about them. You know, there's the he lived as a prince for many years, super lavish environment, and then one day he escaped. He like he was wanted to escape the palace and see what life was really like on the outside of his lush, sensual existence, and encountered a sick man, an old man, and a dead man, and said, "What's that? That and that?" And then realized that life is not quite as luxurious. There it is. <laughs> he was almost thirty. So then he said, "No." Nope. My princely life, the life of luxury is a life of lies. I'm out. No, but you're the prince, you're going to be the king one day. I quit. I want to go see what life is really like for real people. And he does some things. He tries to lead the complete opposite life as an ascetic. He's eating one grain of rice a day. That's not really working out for him. And then under the Bodhi tree, he achieves some kind of Enlightenment through the process of jnana, jnana, or meditation, like stop sitting, contemplating oneself, saying, "Does this work?" And he realized, first of all, no, this is mistaken. This is mistaken. There is dharma, there is karma, but they don't mean this. So no, no, definitely not. And uh, you know, these are great reads, but no. In fact, what he proposes is this. A middle path between the, the two lives that he was leading. He led a lavish life and then a life of asceticism or just complete, I'm not going to do anything, I'm going to eat, I'm going to have, almost like the cynics. In fact, he might have been influenced by the cynics. Okay, I'm not going, I'm going to, neither one of those was great. Like living a life of luxury, you know, it's excess, living a life of deficiency, also not fun. Maybe there's got to be a, a Madhyama Pratipa, somewhere in the middle, that we can do it. So here's what he says first of all. Before we can move any further, I realized four points that I need to establish. And so in Buddhism, these are the four main points that he realizes. The Chakwari Aryasatyana, or the Four Noble Truths. Point number one. There is such a thing as up here, Dukkha. There's a thing, and it's called dukkha, and it's, and it's a thing. It exists. What is it? Suffering. Now, suffering, now, and this is one of those English, it's usually translated as suffering, but it's one of those English translations I don't, I am not particularly fond of. Because what does it mean? What is, what is suffering? Suffering is any kind of lacking whatsoever. We want that. It doesn't have to be, oh, I'm in agony. Okay, I'm being skinned along. Yeah, sure, that's suffering, but that's not what he's talking about. Suffering is when we lack something and then we want it. And you know this, have you ever really, really wanted something? Especially something around like, a, like an object. I really want this for my birthday. Or something like that. There's this overwhelming feeling of I have to have to have that. Has anyone ever gone shopping before when you shouldn't have been? Or you, you go to a grocery store when you're hungry. I have to, yes, I have to have that, yes. Kind of like that. Or you're thirsty, but you're not, say you're not like malnourished, but you're like, oh man, I should really go for a drink. That, that feeling of, I want that. Yeah, that's a thing. And really, that feeling called dukkha, that, that suffering, it comes from this. It comes from Krishna. Desire. The fact that you want stuff. You're, you have that uncomfortable feeling of, oh, I want that because you want things. That's, that's point number two. Okay, so point number one, there is basically pain or lacking or suffering. Point number two, that suffering or pain or lacking comes from the fact that you want stuff. So, conclusion then, if you want to get rid of the suffering, what do you need to get rid of? 
the desire. So that, that's like a nice Aristotelian logical argument there. Right? If desire is causing suffering and you want to get rid of the suffering, get rid of the desire and you're good. That process is called Nerona. Well, how do I do this? Yeah, all right, that sounds great. All right, easy solution. How do I do that, though? Oh, great. <laughs> Another Sanskrit term. The Arya saying the Marga. Great, what's that? And I'm going to summarize this. Doing the right thing at the right place at the right time. So what does that mean? Always behaving in appropriate ways. That's how you do it. What's appropriate? Especially being mindful. Going into every situation, the proper speech, the proper view, the proper intention, and so on. Proper concentration. In other words, be just as prepared as you could for any task. And be prepared for be prepared for anything. I, again, this, this reminds me of the, Sto of the Stoics a bit here in this. Don't seek to have things happen the way you want them to, but go into a situation just kind of like whatever happens, happens. Might actually be a stoic influence here too. Or hang on to get where you go. But Buddha says here, this is out of the Pali Canon, of paths the eightfold, the Arya Sega Marga, is the best. Of truth, the noble four are best. Of Chavari, Arya Satyari. Of mental states, detachment is the best. Of human beings, the illumined one is the best. So detachment in the sense of get yourself away from desires. Get your, listen, if you get away from desires, you're not going to be disappointed. You're not going to be disappointed anymore. Again, that reminds me of what uh, Epictetus was saying. You know, when you, when, if you're worried about losing your favorite jug, realize it's a jug. It's going to break. Here, realize that your problems that you have about like oh, I want this and that oh, oh I wish I could I could do this and I have all these desires. Get rid of the desire. You'll be a lot. Maybe happy is too strong of a word. But you'll at least be a proper person. These are some quotations from the Dhammapada, which is the big collection of Buddha sayings. Not just some, cut down the whole forest of selfish desires, not just, the, not just one tree only. So, I, mean, I want to get better at not wanting this thing. It's all or nothing. Do it or don't. Cut down the whole forest and you'll be on your way to liberation. That word is, that word there, the word liberation is moksha, the one that we've used before in Vedanta talking about the relationship between Brahman and Atman because what Buddha does is he takes a bunch of Vedanta terms and changes their meaning. Here are some conclusions that oops, over here. some conclusions that Buddha realizes. Anitya, which is up there. Anatman, which is literally the opposite of that. And Nibbana. So here's new stuff here. These are the three marks of existence, of which the last one that I have up here is one that's the first noble truth. There's, there is suffering, that's a thing. Look around. Everybody's upset. Why? Because we desire stuff. I wish things went this way. Yeah. If you want to turn that out, if you want to be undisappointed, don't desire things. How do I do that? Be a Buddhist. But here's some other things he realizes. One, Anitya. This, which means uh, nothing is, it's almost like uh, everything is like quicksand. Nothing's, there's no, nothing is firm. Uh, everything's, and this is like Heraclitus, everything's in flux. Everything's changing into this thing and something else. We're always, we're constantly in motion. This is part of why we get disappointed too for Buddha, is that we're constantly wanting things to stay permanent, but what do they do? They change. And we, we say, often we say we like change, except that when it's change we don't want. If you know when we're children, I want to be older, I want to be, you know, old enough that I can leave the house. Okay? Well, I'm going to adulthood, I hope it's going great for you. But everything's in flux. And everything, so really, nothing really, in terms of the firmament, the stuff out there, really just things are being transacted one thing into something else. There's just one big reality, it's in flux. Sounds like air flies. But here's another thing. <laughs> The problem, this is part of the problem too. The problem when we have so much desire is the teaching of, really, this teaching too. You're Atman. What are you? You are the universe. Well, if you're the universe, no wonder you have the desiring problems. I am the universe itself. And so sometimes we get this attitude. Maybe the universe, maybe, you know, reality owes me something. Buddha says, listen, not only are you not owed anything, there is no you to begin with. The Atman is the self. This is a Buddhist teaching. Anatman. 
there is no self. Really, that's what it means. No self, no soul. He especially means this in the sense of for for the Hindus, for the Vedanta, when you die, your Atman, and this is like the implant, your Atman goes back and gets reabsorbed into Brahman and it will be manifested again later, except Buddha says no, that happens. There's just right now, you have this experience of your senses happening right now, stuff going in, light like going into your eyeballs, being interpreted by your nerves and things like that. Obviously, he doesn't know anything about that biological apparatus. But it's just sensations, and you are here, the you is here, so long as you've got sensations, and then when you're dead, you're, none of those sensations are happening anymore. So you're just a, a sense, ex, a bundle of sense experience. I'm using David Hume's words there, but you're a bundle of sense experiences. There really is no you that lives after death. There's no real permanent you even. You're not the same person you were 10 years ago. You won't be the same person 10 years from now. Maybe there's some sort of continuity there, but there's nothing really going on there. If we cut you open, we're not going to find the soul somewhere. It's not going to happen. So complete rejection of Vedanta. Much of the chagrin of Vedanta thing. Really, the goal here is Nibbana. What do you want to do? If there's no you, Really, this whole cycle of samsara that the Hindus talk about, the coming back and being reincarnated, that's a thing, but that's a, not a good thing. You want to get out of that. And really, enlightenment here is not realizing, oh, yes, I am the universe. No, you're a flicker that you need to be put out. Even the word nirvana, it means like to blow out or to extinguish. You want to get out of this. That's what enlightenment is. And we get these little moments. We can get these like in, uh, like trance moments where we're kind of out of our own consciousness. That stuff's awesome, but really the goal is to to not have a life after death of any kind. To be able to just tap and just exit the universe. That's that's the goal. That's the plan. And again, that reminds me of Neoplatonism. You know, if you're going, oh wait a minute, I want to persist afterwards. It's your desire talking. If you're like, no, I want to be something in the afterlife. Again, that's your desire. You want that because of the desires that you have. Now, the, the Greeks would say that's your flesh talking there, right? It's your physicality. We're going to do a little bit of the Nagarjuna. Not going to do too much. Buddhist philosopher, South India. See, common era. Always depicted with a giant snake behind him. He teaches this notion of shunyata. What is shunyata? Nothing exists. Nothing is real. And that's not to say there's something out there called nothing. No, it really exists. It's not that like everything is empty. So all the stuff that Aristotle said about okay, like everything has it. Now it's, he's not in conversation with Aristotle. But anything that Aristotle said about like things having essences. I'm looking at all the tables in here. Them having forms. Uh, if Nagarjuna, no, okay, where's the form of the lectern? Show where, where is it? Like, yeah, I can see the shape of the lectern. Where's the essence? Plato wants to say, where? Oh, it's in the world of forms. Aristotle wants to say, oh, it's right here. We can perceive it. The Vedanta school wants to say, oh, really, it's the universe itself. The Garjan says, I don't see anything. Now he said, yeah, I see stuff. I see tables. I see walls. He's not saying that. He's not saying, oh, I can't believe my eyes right now. That's not what he's saying. He's saying there's no fundamental underlying reality to it. Or when you talk about things like that, it sounds like you're talking about magic. Oh, there's no, there really, there's, I promise you, there's, there's an essence of the eraser. Really, there is, truly. Oh, yeah, where? Oh, forms. In Brahman itself. This is part of Brahman. Okay, I see the eraser, but I don't see Brahman. So, all this talk of essences, it's, it's great, but there's nothing that has its own, like, even this concept of being that the Greeks and Indians love to talk about. Like, where's the being? Like, what's the difference? If I say, picture a pink elephant. Okay, picture that now. Tell me what's the difference between this picture and your mind. I saw a pink elephant. Now picture a pink elephant that is. Does me saying that it is or it exists, does that add anything to the concept? No, because being is empty. Like we talk about all those Aristotle categories. I mean, words are fun. But they don't really, they're just words. There's not really something out there called being. There is no being, there is no essence, there is no substance. All those things that the Greeks really like to talk about. And that's as a result, because there's no constraints, all is possible when emptiness is possible. Nothing is possible when emptiness is impossible. In the sense that, since really there's no essences, the universe is all 
empty, it's devoid of substance. Really, anything imaginable is conceivable that we could encounter in the world. We could encounter anything. So when people say, no, 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 being works that way, or Brahman is this way, or God is this way, the universe doesn't work that way, you've closed yourself off already because you already have a system in place that's hard on essences. Hard on the, the universe is this way, there's no way it could be otherwise. But sometimes, keep in mind, I know here we think of, you might think this applies only to like religious ideas. This happens all the time in the scientific world. When Einstein came up with the notions of relativity, the entire scientific community said, no! Haven't you read Isaac Newton? Things don't work that way. That happens all the time. I have new ideas. Shut up, you're wrong. I can't think of an exception to that rule where someone tries to come up with something innovative or do something new. Where there's resistance, strong resistance to it. It's not just religious community, it's there too. But also in science, with scientists that happens. No, 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 you obviously don't know what you're talking about, Matt Carey. And for the Buddhists then, Dharma is not beauty. The word dharma is used to describe reality itself, teaching itself. But when they say the word dharma, that means like the universe, reality. So for the Vedanta, what's the thing again? What's dharma? Your duty, what you're supposed to do. For the Buddhist, what's dharma? The world. Reality. Even Buddhism itself is sometimes called just dharma. Now there's, for this class, I'm not going to get into the difference between Theravada and Mahayana. Madhyamaka and all that stuff. Come see me in comparative religion. And what's going to happen with Buddhism, like I said, it was originally, it starts out as an Indian phenomenon, and then it kind of leaves India. It becomes almost more popular in China. Where a specific school keeps going. Uh, the Chanzong, which makes its way eventually to Japan, and there Chan becomes Zen. You've probably heard, at least heard of Zen before, but they're doing something a little bit different too. So, let's transition. The first thing we're going to talk about is the notion of Confucianism. So let's go into a little bit of this. I'm not going to do too much here. Again, we're just on a tour. There he is, good old Kongzi, aka Confucius. This is where we're going to start with the Chinese and also with the Islamic thinkers. There's this thing that happens in the West where, like, yeah, they got their own name, but we're not going to call them that. That's too difficult. So instead of Kongzi, we get Confucius. Okay. So you've you probably heard of Confucius, at least heard of him. <laughs> Not well respected in the West. I think um, I said this before in some of my other classes. Uh, the late Justice, Supreme Court Justice Antonin Scalia said that the thoughts of Confucius are only that of fortune cookie wisdom, which leads me to conclude that Scalia had never read anything of Kongsu. So Kongsu. We're also, he lived probably the same time as the pre-Socratics. Okay, where he goes around as sort of like a philosopher for hire. Please hire me and I'll teach you how to be a good king. Or a good prince, or a good duke, or what have you. He's not really popular in his own day, but you see this time when the Han Dynasty ends up becoming a big deal in China. Which is, that's about the same time as the Roman Empire and its supremacy. Uh, <laughs> Confucianism, or the Zhu uh, Xia, is the dominant school of thinking. Like everybody's confused. Much of the chagrin of others. So what does he say? What do we say to do? First of all, he says this. There's this notion of, um, and this is kind of like Dharma. There's uh, Xiang Tang. And Xiang is this notion of heaven. But heaven not like, um, not like an afterlife, but like the perfect, the idea of almost like a world of form. There's heaven that's perfect. And it used to be a long time ago that the kings of China were great people, they did everything right, and then they got selfish and stupid, and that's why we live in, a, in the warring states period today. They wouldn't call it that at the time. But yeah, we're in a terrible, because the, the ancient kings, and we, you see this in uh, Jewish literature as well, like after the exile, how did it come to this? Our ancestors were stupid, they built all idols to other gods and so forth, we shouldn't have done that. Something similar, the, the kings of the past ruined things, so what we need to do is we need to restore things the way they were. So you get back in touch with Tian. Well, how do we do that? Well, first of all, you could be a, uh, you should be a, <laughs> be a Junzi. Usually this is translated as gentleman. In other words, be a good person. Don't be a, uh, Chao 
which is a <laughs> don't be a literally means a tiny man. Right. Yeah. In, I've heard a kind of insignificant person. Tiny man. Don't be a tiny man. Be a gentleman. Well, how do you do that? You go after virtue. And here's what we really need to do. Here's what we really need to do. We need to restore, rectify our relationships. And for Comte, there are five basic relationships. Now, he puts these into masculine language, but they need not be. So this is called the Zheng Ming, or the rectification of names. I think the correcting of roles might be better, a better translation there. So here they are. They're up here. Father, son, elder brother, younger brother, husband, wife, elder, younger, and then underneath that, but if I skip to it, it's going to play me all the way out. Ruler and subject. So like king and citizen, or king and citizen, ruler, subject, whatever you want. And really, Kong Si says all of these are actually the same basic relationship. There's someone in charge, there's a superior and a subordinate. Now, you might and you might immediately be objecting, uh uh, the husband's not a superior to the wife. In ancient times that was a consideration. But you can even think of these as mutual, that's fine. But so like the, what what happens here, and really everything the first relationship is really the basis of all the others. Okay, there should be someone there's someone who's in charge, and there's someone who's subordinate. And what the sub superior person is supposed to do is to be loving towards the person beneath them, whether it be through kindness or gentility or benevolence or consideration, or through uh, the ruler there. We've also got benevolence, too. It comes up again. And then the person in the period in the subordinate position, like the, the, the citizen, is to be loyal to the country. The younger person is supposed to listen to what the older people have to say. The wife is to adhere to what her husband says. Like, here, like be with your younger brother again listen to what your elder your older brother has to say and then the son this is almost the most important concept in all of chinese thought filial piety there's a stuff a holy devotion to one's parents that one's supposed to have it's not a worship but a veneration do and, and it basically blows up do what your parents say but especially your dad but also honor them in every single way possible so a person who badmouths their parents is the worst kind of person imaginable. And that's what's wrong with the world today. And Kongsi even gives it, there's examples in the Analects where it says, you know, this king says, oh, guess what? I got these kids to turn in their parents. And Kongsi says, you are the worst kind of ruler that there is to turn parents against their children. Children should love their parents, and parents should love their children. It's not that you should just listen to what your parents say while they beat you. It's really, everybody should be loving one another in their own community. People in their family just treated, especially sons, children, treated their parents with the respect and dignity they deserve. We'd be, we'd be in touch with Yeah, That'd be great, but we're not. But even if you encounter a stranger, treat them in the same kind of way. Now, later Confucians are going to say, oh, oh, they're not on the list. Not my problem. That's not in Kongsu. And also another part of this, it's not, it's... So much of policy is about you know proper relationships, but also proper behavior everywhere. And this is still true. Like this is where I don't know people think of China as a today. A, it's a communist country. It's more Confucian than communist, even still. Okay, there's uh, notions of appropriateness, and propriety in Chinese culture. You ever heard of a Chinese tea ceremony? There's a ceremony for tea. You don't just say like hey, y'all are tea. It's not that. There are various ways to even pour the kettle. <laughs> it's not just mm, mm, good to go. You want to squeeze a lemon? Sugar? It doesn't work that way. So this kind of very proper organization of really every aspect of life. You see this here, that superior man. That's the junzi. Listen to what he says here, and then we're about to go. A superior man, a junzi, in regard to what he does not know, shows a cautious reserve. Be kind of like Socrates. Yeah, he doesn't know who Socrates is. They're living, actually, Kongsi is before Socrates. If names, that is roles, Zheng, be not correct, language is not in accordance with the truth of things. If language not be in accordance with the truth of things, affairs cannot be carried on to success. When affairs cannot be carried on to success, proprieties and music do not flourish. When proprieties and music do not flourish, punishments will not be properly awarded. When punishments are not properly awarded, the people do not know how to move hand or foot. Therefore, a superior man, Junzi, considers it necessary that the names, the roles, he uses maybe spoken appropriately. Do your correct job. Be a good dad. Be the right kind of brother. Be the right kind of husband. Be the right kind of wife. 
What the Junzi requires is just that his word, just in his words, there may be nothing incorrect. And he gave a list there. Like, if you don't get this right, it leads to this thing, which 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 leads to this thing. You want to fix that stuff over here? Go back to the source. Ad pontus, the Romans will say, to the to the to the source. Get back with this. Get the roles right. Where it says names there, it means like your your job. Like your your role is in like your father, brother, sister, mother, son, don't that kind of stuff. Get those right. And everything else will just sink into place. Well, I don't think that's true. Have you tried it? Well, no. Mm-hmm. It worked in the old times. You don't see any children revolting against their parents in the ancient world. There's some other things I'll talk about uh, later, but that's it.